Section 3 of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mutiny of the Bounty by William Bly. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 3 Fate of the Castaways. Saturday the 9th. About nine in the evening, the clouds began to gather, and we had a prodigious fall of rain with severe thunder and lightning. By midnight we caught about twenty gallons of water. Being miserably wet and cold, I served to the people a teaspoonful of rum each to enable them to bear with their distressed situation. The weather continued extremely bad, and the wind increased. We spent a very miserable night without sleep, except such as could be got in the midst of rain. The day brought no relief but its light. The sea broke over us so much that two men were constantly bailing, and we had no choice how to steer, being obliged to keep before the waves for fear of the boat filling. The allowance now regularly served to each person was one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water at eight in the morning, at noon, and at sunset. Today I gave about half an ounce of pork for dinner, which, though any moderate man would have considered it only as a mouthful, was divided into three or four. All Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the wet weather continued, with heavy seas and squalls. As there was no prospect of getting our clothes dried, my plan was to make everyone strip and wring them through the salt water, by which means they received a warmth that, while wet with rain, they could not have. We were constantly shipping seas and bailing, and were very wet and cold during the night. The sight of the islands, which we were always passing, served only to increase the misery of our situation. We were very little better than starving, with plenty in view. Yet to attempt procuring any relief was attended with so much danger, that prolonging of life, even in the midst of misery, was thought preferable while there remained hopes of being able to surmount our hardships. For my own part I consider the general run of cloudy and wet weather to be a blessing of providence. Hot weather would have caused us to have died with thirst, and, probably, being so constantly covered with rain or sea, protected us from that dreadful calamity. Saturday the 16th. The sun breaking out through the clouds gave us hopes of drying our wet clothes, but the sunshine was of short duration. We had strong breezes at south-east by south, and dark, gloomy weather, with storms of thunder, lightning, and rain. The night was truly horrible, and not a star to be seen, so that our steerage was uncertain. Sunday the 17th, at dawn of day, I found every person complaining, and some of them soliciting extra allowance, which I positively refused. Our situation was miserable, always wet, and suffering extreme cold during the night, without the least shelter from the weather. Being constantly obliged to bail to keep the boat from filling was perhaps not to be reckoned an evil, as it gave us exercise. The little rum we had was of great service. When our nights were particularly distressing, I generally served a teaspoonful or two to each person and it was always joyful tidings when they heard of my intentions. The night was dark and dismal, the sea constantly breaking over us, and nothing but the wind and waves to direct our steerage. It was my intention, if possible, to make to Australia, to the southward of Endeavour Straits, being sensible that it was necessary to preserve such a situation as would make a southerly wind a fair one that we might range along the reefs till an opening should be found into smooth water, and we the sooner be able to pick up some refreshments. Monday and Tuesday were terrible days, heavy rain with lightning. We were always bailing. On Wednesday the 20th, at dawn of day, some of my people seemed half dead. Our appearance was horrible, and I could look no way but I caught the eye of someone in distress. Extreme hunger was now too evident, but no one suffered from thirst, nor had we much inclination to drink, that desire perhaps being satisfied through the skin. 
the little sleep we got was in the midst of water, and we constantly awoke with severe cramps and pains in our bones. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday we were in the same distressed condition, and I began to fear that such another night or two would put an end to us. On Saturday, however, the wind moderated in the evening, and the weather looked much better, which rejoiced all hands, so that they ate their scanty allowance with more satisfaction than for some time past. The night also was fair, but being always wet with the sea, we suffered much from the cold. Sunday the 24th. A fine morning. I had the pleasure to see produce some cheerful countenances, and the first time, for fifteen days past, we experienced comfort from the warmth of the sun. We stripped and hung our clothes up to dry, which were by this time become so threadbare that they would not keep out either wet or cold. This afternoon we had many birds about us, which are never seen far from land, such as boobies and noddies. As the sea began to run fair and we shipped but little water, I took the opportunity to examine into the state of our bread, and found that, according to the present mode of issuing, there was a sufficient quantity remaining for twenty-nine days' allowance, by which time I hoped we should be able to reach Timor. But as this was very uncertain, and it was possible that, after all, we might be obliged to go to Java, I determined to proportion the allowance so as to make our stock hold out six weeks. I was apprehensive that this would be ill-received, and that it would require my utmost resolution to enforce it, for small as the quantity was, which I intended to take away for our future good, yet it might appear to my people like robbing them of life, and some who were less patient than their companions I expected would very ill brook it. However, on my representing the necessity of guarding against delays that might be occasioned in our voyage by contrary winds or other causes, and promising to enlarge upon the allowance as we got on, they cheerfully agreed to my proposal. It was accordingly settled that every person should receive one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread for breakfast, and the same quantity for dinner, so that, by omitting the proportion for supper, we had forty-three days' allowance. Monday the 25th. At noon some noddies came so near to us that one of them was caught by hand. This bird was about the size of a small pigeon. I divided it, with its entrails, into eighteen portions, and by a well-known method at sea of who shall have this, note, one person turns his back on the object that is to be divided, another then points separately to the portions at each of them, asking aloud, who shall have this? To which the first answers by naming somebody. This impartial method of divisions gives every man an equal chance of the best share. It was distributed, with the allowance of bread and water for dinner, and eaten up, bones and all, with salt water for sauce. In the evening, several boobies flying very near to us, we had the good fortune to catch one of them. This bird is as large as a duck. I directed the bird to be killed for supper, and the blood to be given to three of the people who were most distressed for want of food. The body, with the entrails, beak, and feet, I divided into eighteen shares, and with an allowance of bread, which I made a merit of granting, we made a good supper, compared with our usual fare. Sailing on, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I at length became satisfied that we were approaching Australia. This was actually the case, and after passing the reefs which bound that part of the coast, we found ourselves in smooth water. Two islands lay about four miles to the west by north, and appeared eligible for a resting place, if for nothing more. But on our approach to the nearest island, it proved to be only a heap of stones, and its size too inconsiderable to shelter the boat. We therefore proceeded to the next, which was close to it, and towards the main. We landed to examine if there were any signs of the natives being near us. We saw some old fireplaces, but nothing to make me apprehend that this would be an unsafe situation for the night. Every one was anxious to find something to eat, and it was soon discovered that there were oysters on these rocks, for the tide was out 
but it was nearly dark, and only a few could be gathered. I determined, therefore, to wait till the morning, when I should know better how to proceed. FRIDAY THE twenty-ninth, As there were no appearances to make me imagine that any of the natives were near us, I sent out parties in search of supplies, while others of the people were putting the boat in order. The parties returned, highly rejoiced at having found plenty of oysters and fresh water. I had also made a fire by the help of a small magnifying glass, and what was still more fortunate, we found among the few things which had been thrown into the boat, and saved, a piece of brimstone and a tinder-box, so that I secured fire for the future. One of the people had been so provident as to bring away with him from the ship a copper pot. By being in possession of this article, we were enabled to make a proper use of the supply we now obtained. For, with a mixture of bread and a little pork, we made a stew that might have been relished by people of far more delicate appetites, and of which each person received a full pint. The general complaints of disease among us were a dizziness in the head and great weakness of the joints. The oysters which we found grew so fast to the rocks that it was with difficulty that they could be broken off, and at length we discovered it to be the most expeditious way to open them where they were fixed. They were of a good size, and well tasted. To add to this happy circumstance, in the hollow of the land there grew some wire-grass which indicated a moist situation. On forcing a stick about three feet long into the ground, we found water, and with little trouble dug a well, which produced as much as our necessities required. As the day was the anniversary of the restoration of King Charles the Second, I named the island Restoration Island. Our short stay there, with the supplies which it afforded us, made a visible alteration for the better in our appearance. Next day, Saturday the 30th, at four o'clock, we were preparing to embark, when about twenty of the natives appeared, running and hallooing to us on the opposite shore. They were each armed with a spear, or lance, and a short weapon which they carried in their left hand. They made signs for us to come to them, but I thought it prudent to make the best of our way. They were naked and apparently black, and their hair or wool bushy and short. Sunday the 31st. Many small islands were in sight to the northeast. We landed at one of a good height bearing north one-half west. The shore was rocky, but the water was smooth, and we landed without difficulty. I sent two parties out, one to the northward, and the other to the southward, to seek for supplies, and others I ordered to stay by the boat. On this occasion fatigue and weakness so far got the better of their sense of duty, that some of the people expressed their discontent at having worked harder than their companions, and declared that they would rather be without their dinner than go in search of it. One person, in particular, went so far as to tell me, with a mutinous look, that he was as good a man as myself. It was not possible for me to judge where this might have an end, if not stopped in time. Therefore, to prevent such disputes in future, I determined either to preserve my command, or die in the attempt. And seizing a cutlass, I ordered him to take hold of another, and defend himself, on which he called out that I was going to kill him, and immediately made concessions. I did not allow this to interfere further with the harmony of the boat's crew, and everything soon became quiet. We here procured some oysters and clams, also some dogfish caught in the holes of the rocks, and a supply of water. Leaving this island, which I named Sunday Island, we continued our course towards Endeavour Straits. During our voyage Nelson became very ill, but gradually recovered. Next day we landed at another island to see what we could get. There were proofs that the island was occasionally visited by natives from Australia. Encamping on the shore, I sent out one party to watch for turtle, and another to try to catch birds. About midnight the bird party returned, with only twelve noddies, birds which I have already described to be about the size of pigeons. But if it had not been for the folly and obstinacy of one of the party who separated from the other two, and disturbed the birds, they might have caught a great number. I was so much provoked at my plans being thus defeated, 
that I gave this offender a good beating. This man afterwards confessed that, wandering away from his companions, he had eaten nine birds raw. Our turtling party had no success. Tuesday and Wednesday we still kept our course northwest, touching at an island or two for oysters and clams. We had now been six days on the coast of Australia, and, but for the refreshment which our visits to the shores afforded us, it is all but certain that we must have perished. Now, however, it became clear that we were leaving it behind, and were commencing our adventurous voyage through the open sea to Timor. On Wednesday, June the 3rd, at eight o'clock in the evening, we once more launched into the open ocean. Miserable as our situation was in every respect, I was secretly surprised to see that it did not appear to affect anyone so strongly as myself. I encouraged everyone with hopes that eight or ten days would bring us to a land of safety, and after praying to God for a continuance of His most gracious protection, I served an allowance of water for supper, and directed our course to the west-southwest to counteract the southerly winds in case they should blow strong. For six days our voyage continued, a dreary repetition of those sufferings which we had experienced before reaching Australia. In the course of the night we were constantly wet with the sea, and exposed to cold and shiverings, and in the daytime we had no addition to our scanty allowance save a booby and a small dolphin that we caught, the former on Friday the 5th, and the latter on Monday the 8th. Many of us were ill, and the men complained heavily. On Wednesday the 10th, after a very comfortless night, there was a visible alteration for the worse in many of the people, which gave me great apprehensions. An extreme weakness swelled legs, hollow and ghastly countenances, a more than common inclination to sleep with an apparent debility of understanding, seemed to me the melancholy presages of an approaching dissolution. Thursday the 11th. Everyone received the customary allowance of bread and water, and an extra allowance of water was given to those who were most in need. At noon I observed. I had little doubt of having now passed the meridian of the eastern part of Timor, which is laid down in 128 degrees east. This diffused universal joy and satisfaction. Friday the 12th. At three in the morning, with an excess of joy, we discovered Timor. It is not possible for me to describe the pleasure which the blessing of the sight of this land diffused among us. It appeared scarcely credible to ourselves that, in an open boat, and so poorly provided, we should have been able to reach the coast of Timor in forty-one days after leaving Tofoa, having in that time run, by our log, a distance of three thousand six hundred and eighteen miles, and that, notwithstanding our extreme distress, no one should have perished in the voyage. I have already mentioned that I knew not where the Dutch settlement was situated, but I had a faint idea that it was at the southwest part of the island. I, therefore, after daylight, bore away along shore to the south-southwest, which I was the more readily induced to do, as the wind would not suffer us to go towards the northeast without great loss of time. We coasted along the island in the direction in which I conceived the Dutch settlement to lie, and, next day, about two o'clock, I came to a grapnel in a small sandy bay, where we saw a hut, a dog, and some cattle. Here I learned that the Dutch governor resided at a place called Kupang, which was some distance to the northeast. I made signs for one of the Indians who came to the beach to go in the boat and show us the way to Kupang intimating that I would pay him for his trouble. The man readily complied, and came into the boat. The Indians, who were of a dark, tawny color, brought us a few pieces of dried turtle and some ears of Indian corn. This last was the most welcome, for the turtle was so hard that it could not be eaten without being first soaked in hot water. They offered to bring us some other refreshments if I would wait, but as the pilot was willing, I determined to push on. It was about half-past four when we sailed. Sunday the 14th. At one o'clock in the morning, after the most happy and sweet sleep that ever men enjoyed, we weighed, and continued to keep the east shore on board in very smooth water. 
the report of two cannon that were fired gave new life to every one and soon after we discovered two square-rigged vessels and a cutter at anchor to the eastward after hard rowing we came to a grapnel near daylight off a small fort and town which the pilot told me was kupang on landing i was surrounded by many people indians and dutch with an english sailor among them a dutch captain named spikerman showed me great kindness and waited on the governor who was ill to know at what time i could see him eleven o'clock having been appointed for the interview i desired my people to come on shore which was as much as some of them could do being scarce able to walk they however were helped to captain spikerman's house and found tea with bread and butter provided for their breakfast the abilities of a painter perhaps could seldom have been displayed to more advantage than in the delineation of the two groups of figures which at this time presented themselves to each other an indifferent spectator would have been at a loss which most to admire the eyes of famine sparkling at immediate relief or the horror of their preservers at the sight of so many spectres whose ghastly countenances if the cause had been unknown would rather have excited terror than pity our bodies were nothing but skin and bone our limbs were full of sores and we were clothed in rags in this condition with tears of joy and gratitude flowing down our cheeks the people of timor beheld us with a mixture of horror surprise and pity the governor mr william adrian van esty notwithstanding extreme ill health became so anxious about us that i saw him before the appointed time he received me with great affection and gave me the fullest proofs that he was possessed of every feeling of a humane and good man though his infirmity was so great that he could not do the office of a friend himself he said he would give such orders as i might be certain would procure us every supply we wanted a house should be immediately prepared for me and with respect to my people he said that i might have room for them either at the hospital or on board of captain spikerman's ship which lay in the road on returning to captain spikerman's house i found that every kind of relief had been given to my people the surgeon had dressed their sores and the cleaning of their persons had not been less attended to several friendly gifts of apparel having been presented to them i desired to be shown to the house that was intended for me which i found near by with servants to attend it consisted of a hall with a room at each end and a loft overhead and was surrounded by a piazza with an outer apartment in one corner and a communication from the back part of the house to the street i therefore determined instead of separating from my people to lodge them all with me and i divided the house as follows one room i took to myself the other i allotted to the master surgeon mr nelson and the gunner the loft to the other officers and the outer apartment to the men the hall was common to the officers and the men had the back piazza of this disposition i informed the governor and he sent down chairs tables and benches with bedding and other necessaries for the use of every one at noon a dinner was brought to the house sufficiently good to make persons more accustomed to plenty eat too much yet i believe few in such a situation would have observed more moderation than my people did having seen every one enjoy this meal of plenty i dined myself with mr wanjon the governor's son-in-law but i felt no extraordinary inclination to eat or drink rest and quiet i considered as more necessary to the re-establishment of my health and therefore retired soon to my room which i found furnished with every convenience but instead of rest my mind was disposed to reflect on our late sufferings and on the failure of the expedition but above all on the thanks due to almighty god who had given us power to support and bear such heavy calamities and had enabled me at last to be the means of saving eighteen lives in our late situation it was not the least of my distresses to be constantly assailed with the melancholy demands of my people for an increase of allowance which it grieved me to refuse the necessity of observing the most rigid economy in the distribution of our provisions was so evident that i resisted their solicitations and never deviated from the agreement we made at setting out. 
the consequence of this care was that at our arrival we had still remaining sufficient for eleven days at our scanty allowance and if we had been so unfortunate as to have missed the dutch settlement at timor we could have proceeded to java where i was certain that every supply we wanted could be procured we remained at kupang about two months during which time we experienced every possible kindness on the twentieth of july david nelson who had been ill during our voyage died of an inflammatory fever and was buried in the european cemetery of the place having purchased a small schooner and fitted her out under the name of his majesty's schooner resource i and my crew set out for batavia on the twentieth of august we reached that settlement on the first of october where i sold the schooner and endeavored to procure our passage to england we were obliged however to separate and go home in different ships on friday the sixteenth october before sunrise i embarked on board the vlietje packet commanded by captain peter couvret bound for middleburg with me likewise embarked mr john samuel clerk and john smith seaman those of our company who stayed behind the governor promised me should follow in the first ships and be as little divided as possible on the thirteenth of march seventeen ninety we saw the bill of portland and on the evening of the next day sunday march fourteenth i left the packet and was landed at portsmouth by an isle of wight boat those of my officers and people whom i left at batavia were provided with passages in the earliest ships and at the time we parted were apparently in good health nevertheless they did not all live to quit batavia thomas hall a seaman had died while i was there mr elphinstone master's mate and peter linkletter seaman died within a fortnight after my departure the hardships they had experienced having rendered them unequal to cope with so unhealthy a climate as that of batavia the remainder embarked on board the dutch fleet for europe and arrived safe in this country except robert lamb who died on the passage and mr ledward the surgeon who has not yet been heard of thus of nineteen who were forced by the mutineers into the launch it has pleased god that twelve should surmount the difficulties and dangers of the voyage and live to revisit their native country End of chapter three